How many of you have uh, seen a presentation concerning Mississippi's uh, cottage program before? Does anyone here know anything about it? Just a few hands out there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead while we're trying to get the presentation up and just briefly discuss the process. Uh, governor Barber, our Mississippi governor, was very concerned about families having to spend extended periods of time in FEMA travel trailers or even more substandard standard housing. And if we can get the presentation up, I can show you what I'm talking about. FEMA travel trailer is a, is a great option uh, for six months, a year, 18 months, while a family tries to rebuild their, their home or rental property becomes available. So in most disaster situations, in most hurricanes, it's a very good option. Governor Barber and a lot of the very bright people in Mississippi understood uh, very early on that it wasn't going to be 12 months or 18 months. It was going to be five years or longer before the housing stock was rebuilt. And so he started working with uh, Mississippi's congressional delegation and the delegations of other coast states to try to get funding to do this, this pilot program. And the fortunate thing is that it was ultimately funded. The unfortunate thing is that it took uh, over a year from when the storm hit before the funds were finally made avail available. But based on his vision and the vision of quite a few other very bright people, um, we were able to obtain the grant funding through FEMA. And we were able to go into design, which was really not that difficult because those, those bright people that I'm talking about after the storm, they already had great concepts in mind. So we went very quickly from, from that concept into final design. We bid these units out and, and, and finally procured them. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that part of the process. I'm going to spend most of my time talking about where we are now and what the challenges we face as we're trying to move this, this pilot program into either demobilization of the units, removing the families, putting them in other fa housing units, or converting to permanency. So let me go get into this presentation. This gives you an idea of the scope of the disaster in Mississippi. Uh, this is not even including the numbers in Alabama, Texas, and of course, Louisiana. Uh, the numbers are just mind-boggling when you look at them. 220,000 that were damaged, 61,381 units that were destroyed, and most of them look like that, nothing but slabs left. And just in the three coastal counties, 52,512, major damage were destroyed, the vast majority were totally destroyed, nothing left to rebuild. To give you an idea, we only have around 300,000 people in our three coastal counties, and if you figure 2.5 or so per household, you can see that that 50,000 was a very high percentage of the total housing stock on the coast. I told you that there were huge challenges. The first challenge was getting those travel trailers in place. From around the 1st of September when the mobilization of the, of the FEMA assets uh, started until roughly Christmas, uh, we, we, FEMA was able to put about over 40,000 of these travel trailers in place. Until then, we couldn't get people to leave their property. So by their choice, people were living in tents in many cases, or their cars, or wherever, because they didn't want to leave whatever small amount of property that they still had. There's a CB base in Gulfport, Mississippi, and the CBs tried to help out. They built a number of these little villages. It has wooden floor, wooden walls, and then a canvas tent that's draped over the top of it. Some families preferred this to the travel trailer. We were very concerned because of the possibility of fire hazard. Having young family, uh, in some cases children in these units, you could see what would happen if, if one of these units caught fire and it could spread very quickly throughout the entire compound. So the people that ran these units were always very careful to try to minimize the threat of fire. 
kind of hard to see this graphic, but this gives you an idea. Uh, as I said, over 40,000 FEMA travel trailers and a few mobile homes, but it was primarily travel trailers were occupied at the peak somewhere around January, February 2006. Currently, there are 2,259 units that are still occupied throughout Mississippi. About 1,500 of those units are in the three coastal counties. For future reference, Hancock County is the, the, the uh, county that's depicted here on the, the bottom left, or excuse me, my, uh, yes, your, your bottom left. Then Harrison County is in the center and Jackson County is, is to the right. Uh, and then you have the, the next tier counties, Pearl River, Stone, and George. But there were units throughout the state of Mississippi because we had hurricane force winds 150 miles inland. But the vast majority were here on the coast. This gives you an idea of what the FEMA travel trailer looks like in what's called a, an egg site or emergency group site. These were locations that FEMA either leased land or obtained land from other governmental entities such as school districts or city or county government. And they established these group sites because these were, the, the people in the group sites were primarily renters before the storm and their apartment or rental property was destroyed. Therefore, uh, they didn't necessarily have a lot to put their their FEMA trailer on. So these group sites were established. As these units were demobilized, they were taken to a staging area in Purvis, Mississippi. There are literally tens of thousands of units that are sitting there that, that FEMA has not decided exactly what they want to do with these. There are the issues dealing with formaldehyde and other safety issues with the units. So in my opinion, it's very unlikely these will ever be sold, and more than likely, most of these will be destroyed. Um, the whole issue of formaldehyde is very complex. What exactly is a safe level? Um, I have my own opinions about that. If you get a variety of scientists, they all have their opinions about it, but FEMA's now going to a very, very low level of formaldehyde. In my opinion, it may be a little bit too low. Whoops. The reason I have this slide is to show you, this is not a prop here. This was a family that had a very nice home that was right on the Mississippi coast that was destroyed, and they couldn't get their home rebuilt, you know, very quickly, so they were eligible for a travel trailer. The point is these were not just low-income families. This was low-income, middle-income, and wealthy people. Now, this family did rebuild within the first year, year and a half, but you literally had a Rolls-Royce sitting out in front of a uh, FEMA travel trailer. And for the most part, the families were very appreciative of what FEMA uh, did to provide them some place to live as they rebuilt their home. 2006, around December or so of 2006, November time frame, somewhere in there, we were notified that we would be getting this grant. It took us two or three months to work through the process of, the, uh, of receiving the grant. And as I said, we went into final design and procured the units between that January through June time frame. First unit was occupied the 21st of June. This is one of our, our one-bedroom units right here. They come in one, two, and three-bedroom units. As you can see, at the height of the program, we had 2,829 of these units that were occupied. We are now concluding the temporary phase of the program, and I'll talk about what that means here in just a minute. The one-bedroom unit or park model, uh, approximately 400 square feet, it's hard to tell from this picture, but they're very high-quality units. You have uh, sheetrock interior walls, painted walls, lapboard siding on the outside, that's, that's wood rail and posts there, nice metal roofs on them. And they were designed in what's called a single shotgun style of, of housing, which is very typical of the Mississippi Gulf Coast and of, of Louisiana, city of New Orleans. Uh, you will see many homes that were built like this uh, that were in the, in the older neighborhoods of, of our coastal communities. In fact, many of the older homes like this were destroyed. And that's why this design was uh, developed, was to try to fit in with the architecture of the Mississippi Gulf Coast. We have a two and three bedroom unit, and you can see the square footage there. 
Now, let me talk a little bit about the design of these. I didn't know that I didn't know anything about HUD or modular housing before I got involved in this. I've never been involved in housing before. But I've learned a lot about it, and I now know that HUD code is, uh, is what most people consider to be model home, mo excuse me, mobile home. And then you have modular housing, which is a different set of codes and standards, and it fluctuates from city to city and, and county to county, state to state. This unit with the wheels and metal frame meets all of the HUD standards as a mobile home. If you remove the metal frame and the, and the, uh, the, uh, the wheels and the axles and attach it to a permanent modular foundation that meets the building co codes of the community as well as the uh, state, then it becomes a modular unit. So each one of these units are dual coded, both as a mobile home slash HUD unit and also as a modular unit. And you guys probably know a whole lot more about that than I do, but... Uh, uh, that, that was part of the thought process as well because we wanted to be able to move to permanency with these units in the communities that would allow them to be kept there. We're now down around a little bit less than 2,000 families that are still in our cottages. All the cottages that are installed in Mississippi currently are temporarily installed. Now, the only thing that makes them temporary is, in many cases, the utilities are not buried. Everyone that's installed now, except for a few demonstration models, are installed as mobile homes or HUD sets. Therefore, they're on the stacked dry block, and they have straps. Uh, in many locations that are zoned for mobile homes, they could stay as long as we just buried the utilities, and that's the process we're starting right now. But in most of the municipalities, they will not allow a mobile home to be left. Therefore, we're trying to work through the process of converting some of these units from mobile home to modular sets. There has been a lot of reluctance in many of these jurisdictions to allow these units, first of all, to be placed at all. Remember, I told you that we didn't get the funding until January, February time frame of 2007. And so by June, when we set our first unit, there were many communities who said, well, we're almost two years past the storm. Why are you putting another temporary unit? We tried to emphasize to them, if somebody had been living in a travel trailer for a year and a half, this was a much better alternative for them. And so ultimately, all of the jurisdictions allowed some cottages to be placed. Some were very open about it, and some were very restrictive on where the units could be placed. We are now, as I said, in the process of either deactivating the unit, pulling it out of service, or converting it to permanency. And we're, like I say, around a little bit less than 2,000 units still have families living in them. Because this was a temporary program, we convinced uh, FEMA to allow us to install these units without elevating them to the flood standards. Because of that, FEMA said, okay, but you must pay for insurance for these units regardless. Because they were temporary units and installed below the floodplain, we had 230 units that were destroyed by Hurricane Gustav. And Gustav just brushed by Mississippi as it went into Louisiana. The point being that none of these units are going to be installed permanently unless they're elevated. And in some cases, those elevations are... 8, 10, 12, 16, 20 feet above the ground. So from a practical standpoint, from an engineering standpoint, we have set as a standard saying we will not install any unit more than 5 feet 7 inches above the ground. If a family wishes to purchase the cottage and do their own elevation, they can do so, but we will not do it using our grant funds. But there's a whole series of issues dealing with floodplain ordinances across the Mississippi Gulf Coast and unfortunately, it will mean that somewhere between 800 and 1,000 families will either have to move their cottage somewhere else or they'll have to do their own elevations. Talking about the transfer of ownership, our Articles of Agreement with FEMA says we can, we can allow the people that are currently in the cottages to purchase them at a reduced rate. Uh, or we can take people that are in FEMA trailers if their local jurisdiction will allow them to take a cottage and transfer ownership to them. 
or we can work with nonprofit organizations. In fact, we're uh, trying to work right now to give Habitat for Humanity about 40 of our units so that they can use these to house some of the families they work with. We're going to try to, to keep everyone as a, as, a, as a housing unit converted to permanency. But ultimately, if we cannot do that, any of the units that have to be disposed of will simply be disposed of using the state's surplus property, which means sealed bid. And then the proceeds from that uh, process either have to be used to help support the program in this permanency phase, transferring other units to permanency, or used for other type of housing, low-income housing uh, uh, across Mississippi. Just to give you an overview of currently the FEMA situation, these are not our cottages. We have approximately 2,000 cottages in service right now. FEMA has approximately 2,000 52 travel trailers, mobile homes, park models, still in service across Mississippi. As I said, about 1,500 of those are in our coastal counties, Hancock, Harrison, and Jackson County. And to briefly tell you other housing initiatives of the state of Mississippi, we received a community development block grant money to try to help rebuild affordable housing or workforce housing. First, there was the Homeowners Assistance Program where if a family was outside of the special flood hazard area, outside of a designated flood zone pre-Katrina, and did not know that they needed flood insurance, then they were able to get a grant up to $150,000 to repair or replace their home, and then an additional $30,000 to elevate if necessary. So that was phase one of the program. $1.4 billion was provided to Mississippi citizens. Again, these were families that were outside of the designated flood zone pre-Katrina and therefore they did not realize that they needed flood insurance. Most of those families have now rebuilt or repaired their homes. And then in phase two, this was families inside of the flood zone, but they were low to moderate income families that could not afford flood insurance. We have three military bases along the Mississippi Gulf Coast, or we did at the time of the storm, and there were lots of military retirees, still are, and so you had you had these families that may be living on a very low military retirement. They could have be, be in their 80s, and they had let their flood insurance lapse when their mortgage was paid off. And that's really what this phase two was, was focused on, was those families that just had not, did not have the money to maintain flood insurance, uh, even though they were in a special flood hazard area. There were all, we've also have initiatives to rebuild the, the rental property under the long-term workforce housing and small rental programs. I'm not going to go into detail because these are not my programs, but there's a, a, a good website you can go to under Mississippi Development Authority and find out the details on those programs. Uh, you just look under Katrina Recovery at, S, at uh, MDA's uh, website, and it can take you and, and talk, talks to you about the small rental and workforce housing. And I think that's about my time and ready to move to the next presenter. Thank you all.